All right, always highly anticipated. Tom Patterson is up next. Okay, Tom Patterson is a cartographer at the U.S. National Park Service, located in Harper's Ferry Center. His interests include shaded relief, 3D terrain presentation, natural color mapping, and world map projections. Although today he's not talking about any of those things. Yeah, I'm actually gonna talk about my, uh, my day job for a change at the National Park Service. Uh, there's three cartographers in my office and we're paid exclusively to make uh, paper maps of the national parks and uh, that's where all the money comes from and because we're only making paper maps, we try to make paper maps that can be extended in their usefulness to other areas and a lot of the new things that I'm gonna be talking about today are these new areas that we're going into and I have uh, probably about 10 times as many slides as Daniel, so I better get into this really quickly. Uh, first up is our, uh, our website, the so-called uh, Cardo website. Uh, I created this thing uh, 20 years ago, so this, this year is the 20 year anniversary of the site. It's pretty popular. Last year we had 160 million hits, um, but uh, we have a problem with the website. It's, uh, it's basically held together with duct tape and, and rubber bands and, and paper clips. So this year we're completely rebuilding it um, from scratch and I just want to tell you about a few new things that we will have on the, um, on the website. This is just a, a mock-up of the old website. I stuck up a, a little map of, of Crater Lake because for the first time ever, we're gonna actually have little preview images of the park maps that you're gonna be downloading. So you no longer have to click on the button and hope for the best that you're getting the map that you really want to see. Another thing that we're uh, excited about, and this is really kind of a small kind of thing, is that uh, we're gonna be including uh, high resolution JPEGs as a download uh, option. A lot of people wanna just see um, those. In addition to the, uh, the layered uh, Illustrator files that uh, a lot of you have downloaded. And uh, lastly, the thing I wanna talk about are um, geospatial uh, PDFs. We have about 100 of our, or 200 of our maps converted to um, geospatial uh, PDF that you could um, download um, from our site. So that's our uh, website. We also um, uh, upload maps to the Avenza Map Store. I think a lot of you are uh, familiar with this. You could use the Avenza Maps uh, app, uh, download a geospatial PDF, use it on your mobile device, and you see the pulsing blue dot showing where you are. Ooh, pretty nice. You could also drop pins, make notations, and, and so forth. And uh, uh, these are proving to be pretty popular. And in addition, uh, each of our uh, park maps we, uh, we save in ZoomFI format in very, just very basic interactive format where you could just pan around, zoom in, zoom out. And these are uploaded onto every park's um, homepage. So if you go to Yellowstone National Park or Crater Lake uh, National Park, as this example is, you'll see a Zoomify map that you could uh, interact with uh, interactively. So we're, we're taking our venerable old paper maps and trying to get them online as, as much as um, possible. Okay, these uh, housekeeping items out of the way. Another thing, and this is something that excites me a lot more, I think you're all familiar with uh, the uh, panoramas uh, painted by Heinrich Baran. He painted uh, Yosemite, Yellowstone, Denali, and North Cascades in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, they're printed in poster form. We brought about 100 of these older posters here to the conference. They're out by the registration table. Help yourself to them. They're pretty big. They're about a meter wide. Uh, so you'll need to find some way to roll them up and get them back home. But I have really good news. We have digitally remastered the uh, Baran uh, panoramas. Uh, we've we've uh, photographed them uh, high res. Each of the panoramas are over 12,000 pixels wide. These are gonna be up on our website uh, after the first of the year. There's gonna be two versions, one like you see here with the, uh, the black title band and labels, and the other one will be you know, blank, so you could download it, use it for wallpaper, republish it, do whatever you want with it. And here's just a couple examples of what you'll see. I mean, these are really high res. We're only partially zoomed in right now, but you're, you're you know, close enough now that you can see Heinrich's uh, you know, brush strokes in Yosemite Valley. All the colors are vivid. Our color management specialist spent a couple weeks trying to emulate the colors that Baran used on his panoramas. And here's just another example of the, uh, the summit of Denali up in Alaska. So a whole new uh, panorama uh, and a whole new view of the summit. 
Okay, uh, another thing that we have up at our website, and this is uh, something that's uh, dear to my heart, are our recreation symbols, uh, sometimes called universal symbols, international symbols, whatever you want to call them. We actually in-house call them uh, pictographs. Uh, in 2007, we had our entire collection that was made by the hand of many unified in a, into a standard um, symbol set. We started off with uh, 40 symbols or so, and it's since grown a little bit. We now have uh, 236 symbols. Uh, myself and uh, you know, Jake Coolidge is over there. He helps out a little bit with this. Lauren Linez in the, in the sign program helps out. We periodically have to make new symbols upon the request of parks. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, symbol um, design. One of the overriding um, concepts that we use is we try to go from very specific to the generic. On the left, of course, you see you know, Einstein's face. That symbol can only be used for one instance to depict Einstein. To the right, we see a smiley face. That symbol could be used to depict people who actually smile. And I think there are a few people in this world who don't. The symbol on the right would be everyone, because I think everyone in this world has a head. So uh, with that introduction, uh, the most universal uh, person I can think of is someone we call um, Helvetica person. I guess he's kind of androgynous. He was formerly a man uh, who <laughs> engages in uh, a lot of different activities, you know, sports activities. He dutifully uh, throws away his litter and occasionally has to be warned not to fall off of high cliffs. <laughs> now, designing these symbols is uh, a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, I typically, when I design a symbol, I make uh, several versions and ask colleagues which ones they like best. I often seek out people who don't deal with graphics on a regular basis just to see if they get it. You know, look at these symbols. It's almost like taking a Rorschach test. Everyone sees something a little bit uh, different. In this case, this was um, for surveillance uh, camera. There's one on me right now from the back of the room. And uh, I, my first thought was, let's go with CCTV. And then you know, it kind of occurred to me that you know, most Americans don't really know what CCTV stands for. So uh, I next drew uh, inspiration from the spy cam outside my cubicle on the ceiling. And uh, everyone looked at that and said, Tom, that's just too creepy. And in the end, we went with that uh, typical you know, traffic ticket camera that you see on, on the right. You know, other times with our symbols, you know, a perfectly good symbol that we've used for decades just falls out of fashion or its meaning changes. This is the symbol we used for amphitheaters in uh, national parks. What the parks were finding, guess what people were going there to find? You betcha. Yeah, there. <laughs> so we had to change uh, the amphitheater symbol to something like that. It's not as good of an amphitheater symbol, but at least people aren't going there with their smartphones expecting something else. And um, I have a couple new symbols that we've uh, uh, designed. The first one on the left is uh, tornado shelter. And, and if you, you know, take exception with some of these designs, remember these symbols appear only three and a half millimeters high on our map, so they have to be very simplified. The next one uh, to the right is tide pooling. This is something done for Olympic National Park. The next one is uh, bike rack. And last but not least, I'm gonna ask you, what do you think that last one is? Okay, someone said tactile model. I'm really surprised you got it. My wife thinks that's someone picking up litter, um, <laughs> which is a segue into the next section I want to talk about, and that's accessibility in the National Park Service. Uh, the Park Service takes accessibility very uh, seriously. In the case of maps, accessibility almost exclusively means maps for the uh, uh, visually impaired and the blind, and this, I have to say, is a really tough nut to crack. Take, your, for example, our map of Olympic National Park. There's some 400 type objects on this map, not including all the extraneous type and stuff around it. How do you distill this thing down for a blind person to use? One of the things we, uh, we experimented doing, this was a collaboration with the American Publishing House for the Blind, is to create a tactile braille map on this uh, visualization, everything, everything you see in black would be a slightly raised surface on a thermoform uh, model. Now one of the big problems with tactile bra uh, braille maps are braille cells are the equivalent of 27-point text. 
So therefore, you can't get many labels on the map. You know, so we'll go for over 400 down to half a dozen on here. We also have to rely on all kinds of made up symbols and, uh, and, and textures. Almost 40 years ago, I took a seminar on mapping for the blind at university, and the maps looked very much like this. But one of the big problems is just a complete lack of standardization with tactile maps. Along with the map itself, which appears on a standard 11 by 11 and a quarter inch sheet, adjacent to it in a booklet, you have to use a legend identifying what all those things are. So a blind person would have to go back and forth between the legend and the map for the first time trying to figure out what is it that that star represents? It's not standardized. One of the things I think is better for, uh, for the blind is um, audio description. Uh, the written languages are very standardized. Most people understand the written word. And so what you could do, especially online, is you can have an alt text and, and someone could hear a machine read description of the map. Better than describing the map itself, though, I would say it's better to describe the place that the map is showing. It's not about the map. It's about the territory, not the map. And of course, this is, you know, all the important information is up at the top, and then it cascades down and gives uh, increasing detail as you read through this. This is still experimental on our, uh, at the National Park Service right now. We also just do a lot of tactile maps for park uh, desks and, and visitor centers. These are designed so that a person could feel the maps with one hand. So they tend not to be over 20 inches in size. And they're quite a challenge. You know, this is Kenai Fjords, Alaska, very complex fjorded coastline. The dots that you see on the terrain represent glaciated areas. The uh, uh, parallel diagonal lines are water areas. And you can see the park boundary um, too. There's a limit to how much stuff, however, that you could put onto these uh, tactile maps. Um, this is kind of a, a good lead into outdoor models. We're doing a lot of these. You see the big models in the inside visitor centers. You know, they're often 10 feet wide with all kinds of you know, imagery on them and so forth. Outside, it's a little bit trickier because you know, we, um, we can't apply those images and have them withstand uh, the weather. I'm working on some um, outdoor models for Grand Teton National Park. This is the new Jenny Lake Visitor Center. This, this puppy is uh, 12 feet uh, wide. It's gonna be cast in, in bronze and it has to span that distance between those two boulders. It's gonna be uh, printed out with a 3D uh, uh, si modeling system in sections, both vertically and horizontally, and then cast in bronze. Here's another model for that same visitor center. It's gonna be outdoors. Uh, I've also developed a, a technique where I can embed type into the models. Of course, you know, the terrain should be flat or nearly flat because it's really hard to read it when it's on a mountain like Grand uh, Teton. One thing to notice, look how the lakes are recessed into the landscape. The park wanted rainwater to collect in the lakes to uh, emulate uh, reality. Okay, um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, at the National Park Service, we are changing the map projection that we use uh, for all of our, our printed maps. Uh, you know, historically we've used uh, you know, the UTM projection, whatever zone it might be in, NAT 83. And after careful consideration, you know, drum roll, we decided to go with the Web Mercator projection. Yeah, I know. Uh, I would have been horrified admitting this 10 years ago. But you know, times change, people change, and I'll explain the reasons behind uh, doing this. Um, our maps have to fit into brochure layouts. The layouts are very tight, so it's important when we convert from uh, one projection to, to the Web Mercator that we maintain size. We do it in, in Adobe Illustrator using Map Publisher. We use the, uh, the artboard in, uh, in Illustrator as a minimum area bounding rectangle around the park, and then we convert. We're gonna go from UTM Zone 17 North right now to Web Mercator. Watch this carefully. Did you see a change? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not really that big, was it? We changed, you know, both you know, all the vector information, including labels. The, the relief has to be done um, separately. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. That works okay at Great Smoky Mountains. It's relatively southern latitude. Yeah, this guy's nodding his head. What happens when you go north? Let's go north to Alaska to the northernmost park, Gates of the Arctic. It's above the Arctic Circle. This happens to be in the uh, Albers uh, projection, the Alaskan Albers parameters. 
let's see what happens when we go from, from that to the Weber Cater. You know, that wasn't too bad, was it? You know, you're prepared for much worse. I mean, it fits on the page. Okay, let me tell you some of the reasons we go with uh, the Web Mercator projection. We're gonna go south to Pu'u Hanua, or Ho Now Now, National Historical Park, Kona Coast of Hawaii. Try saying that after having a couple of beers. Um, one of the things I really like about the Web Mercator projection is if you've got north, south, east, west boundaries on a park, they align perfectly with the edge of the paper, your computer monitor, you're living in a rectilinear world. That's really nice. And that's one of the key advantages. Uh, speaking about a rectilinear world, if you have placed imagery, in this case it's a ghosted spot image behind uh, the map, you can go between you know, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop by copying and pasting, everything lines up. So you could do all these very special effects easily. Before, when we used the UTM, the placed image would be, you know, had to have 2.13 degrees rotation. It was quite the mess. Now, related to that, you know, how many times have you updated a map, you need like a little road, and you end up having to download all roads in California to get that road you need? Well, you know, there's an easier way. You know, go to your you know, favorite web mapping service, do a screenshot, bring it over into your web Mercator map, align it, you know, scale a little bit, bingo, it fits. You can trace your road in a couple minutes, job done, and you can move, move on. And uh, last but not least, uh, you know, since our maps are now in the Web Mercator uh, projection, we can export the, the maps as, as web tiles. You know, here we are back at uh, Puho in, Ho in Hawaii, looking at uh, Google Maps. And here's that same you know, park map exported uh, from um, Events of Map Publisher as web tiles compatible with, uh, with Google Maps. And you know, of course, you know, this isn't a true web map. These are old school raster tiles. You guys are into vector tiles now, I know. Um, but you know, when you zoom in us, the, the map gets larger. You don't get uh, more detail. But that's you know, sometimes kind of handy for you know, you know, people with uh, you know, you know, visual impairments. They, the, the labels actually get bigger when you zoom in, which is kind of nice for them. And uh, here we are you know, zoomed in. Uh, the royal grounds, by the way, that's where the Hawaiian ali'i, the royal royalty, uh, resided. But every time I see this label, I think, what a great name for a coffee shop. And then finally, here we are, um, another version of web tile from a park map. This is exported to OpenStreetMap, Summit of Mount Rainier, and you know, I think that's kind of nice, nice uh, change from OpenStreetMap. And with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you very much. Thank you.